QSO Today, episode 428, Mooner Salem, K6AQ. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest amateur radios and accessories for your ham radio station, and by Nuts and Volts magazine. Save the date, the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will return on March 25th and 26th, 2023. We are making changes and upgrades that reflect our user feedback. If you did not fill out the Expo survey that we sent to you recently, please click on the banner in this week's show notes page or on the weekly podcast notification. We want to hear from you, even if you did not attend the last Expo. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates, through in-depth interviews, just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Just a note to let you know that the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is back up on YouTube. There are now over 300 presentations for me to upload, and I hope to add one or two a day to the channel. I will put a link on the QSO Today website and the Expo webpage. Please subscribe to this channel as it helps us to get new tools from YouTube when we go over 1,000. Mooner Salem K6AQ discovered amateur radio provides plenty of opportunities for hams who also love computers and computer programming. K6AQ loves open source, contributing to HF digital voice development in the free DV project and improving on WinLink HF digital email gateways. Combine all this with software-defined radio, and you have an active 21st century ham. K6AQ is my QSO today. K6AQ, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Munir? 4Z1UG, I'm K6AQ. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? It started back in the when I was in high school, in about um, 2000 or so. I basically decided... Before then, I would visit my uncle on um, NBI um, over in Ohio, and I'd see his ham radio stuff. So I, that kind of put the seed in my head. When I was in high school, basically, I decided that I was going to try to transfer, like transmit and receive data, kind of like, um, kind of like what would be considered Wi-Fi now. So I figured, since I had that like experience in my head from um, from like visiting my uncle and stuff, that like I would just get my radio license. So. I went and I bought the, I forget what the reference um, was called back then, like probably one of the AWRL license books, and actually um, practiced until I got enough questions right that I could comfortably take the take the test. And then I, I took it. I ended up getting my technician license. Um, and at that time, the tech license didn't require um, Morse code, but um, I believe General and Extra still did. So um, I got my license, and then... I ended up realizing that um, at the time, like packet radio was pretty much 1200. Um, it still is 1200 baud for the most part. Um, so it, and even then, even though it was still a lot of dial-up internet back then, it was still um, 1200 was still pretty slow even for the standards of the late 90s, early 2000s. So that kind of that kind of was not really a thing. It was discouraging, right? Yeah, it was pretty discouraging. That wasn't what you thought. Can we go back just a little bit, just so that we can kind of set the stage here? What was the hometown in those days? I grew up in um, Riverside, California. So basically, that's um, about an hour-ish east of L.A. So you grew up in Riverside, California. This interest in, say, broadband over RF, which I guess is now Wi-Fi, and I guess you were expecting that you could actually move images and things like that really fast over amateur radio frequencies— did that come from, did you have an interest in computing? Were you a computer hacker? Did you have, what did your desk look like before you became a ham? I actually was really big into computing, like computer stuff in general. Um, as a kid, like um, my dad had a convenience store over in um, Lake Elsinore. And um, I'd end up there a lot of the time, like after school and stuff and in the back. And there, I had like a, um, 
I think at the time I had like a 480, a Packard Bell 486 computer at home. And I had like a similar spec, like um, laptop later on. Um, and then I would do a lot of like QBasic and that sort of thing on the, on the laptop. And then we used to use um, Prodigy at home as well. So I would be on Prodigy a fair bit. And then it was kind of funny, like in 96 or so, when Prodigy got the ability to go on the internet, I ended up doing that. And um, I didn't realize at the time that basically um, Prodigy charged per hour for that. Do you recall that Prodigy was first available in supermarkets as a disc? You'd be going through the checkout line and you'd see these Prodigy discs sitting on the side there and you'd take them home and that's how they think they first started. Oh, I didn't realize that. It was kind of cool because I remember at the time that we were just getting to the point of having dial-up modems that actually work faster than 2400 baud or 9600 baud. I mean, I think they were kind of moving up in speed up to, what, 566 in those days. But there was Prodigy. There was another one at the same time. Do you recall who that was, CompuServe? There was CompuServe, and then there was AOL as well. Right. These were the ways that we got onto the Internet. And I guess even the Internet at the time was kind of undefined territory. This was before like people realized that you could buy stuff online and like do all these other things. Like if you if you look at the internet now, for example, there's like you can watch video online, like through all sorts of like streaming services like Netflix and um, YouTube and all those other ones. That was basically unimaginable back in like the late nineties because we didn't have we simply didn't have the bandwidth for that. We didn't have moving images on our screens either, I don't think, at that point. I don't think we had file sharing services quite yet in terms of being able to pass video unless they were terrifically large files to people? Well, they had like BBS services and stuff back then. But like, as, as you said, it was basically um, it was basically um, smaller files for the most part, maybe like text or like smaller computer program types of things. So what did you like to do? You like to write programs? Pretty much. So I ended up doing a lot of um, a lot of programming. Um, I think like one one time that I remember, for example, I tried to write like a cash register type program in um, QBasic. So, so I was basically trending more towards like practical programs rather than like stuff like games. Because I know like back in the, I've been watching a lot of like retro YouTube, like retro computing YouTube, and um, a lot of the focus seems to be on games, gaming in those videos. And I remember I didn't really do like much game programming really. It was more like practical stuff like that cash register program that I was mentioning. Because your parents had a small convenience store. That's right. They actually had a need. Son, if we're going to buy a computer, we should somehow be able to run the store with it. Yeah, they ultimately didn't use it. They still used like the standalone cash register, not like um, not like what you would find in a store today with like um, like a full on point of sale system. It was basically just like a cash register where they program buttons for like the various items or whatever, and they put and they just push the buttons when they want to ring something up, that sort of thing. And that seemed to work just fine in those days. Yep. Okay, so I'm assuming you went on for a degree after high school. And what was that degree in? Yeah, I went down to um, UC San Diego. So down here in San Diego where I live now. I mean, and I originally, um, I got into school um, as a computer engineering major. But I realized that I wanted to specialize more in the software side of things. So I ended up switching over to computer science. So I did the computer science degree. Um, and I graduated in about 2007 or so, and ended up um, working for the medical. Ended up working for a medical device company here, where I'm actually still working now, working on mainly the infusion pumps for um, for hospitals. Oh, that's really cool! Infusion pumps these days, for anybody that's being infused, I guess they also will warm the liquid as well and set the flow rate and all that stuff so that you get it at the right dosage at the right temperature. I haven't heard about the temperature thing, but the flow rate is a big thing that pumps automatically set up. A lot of the infusion pumps that are out there, they have what's effectively called a, da a data set. And it has it basically just has what the minimum and maximum like safe dosages are for the drugs that the hospital would commonly use. When the doctor prescribes a certain infused medication, um, the nurse can plug it in, either just type it into the system or like... What's more common these days is have the EMR system send it over to the pump. EMR system automat effectively automatically enters all that stuff for the for the nurse. So when either of those things happens, um, the device can actually 
ver double check those settings. And if something looks off, then it can actually block the infusion from happening. So it actually prevents a lot of um, in like accidents related to um, over infusing or under infusing a patient. Well, that's very interesting. So you have a degree in computer science. You're working on stuff that's very practical. And it sounds to me like when you got your amateur radio license, that the idea of doing something really practical was on your mind as you got the license. And then you discover that, you know, packet radio is really, at the time, I think, was 1,200 baud, 2,400 baud. With AX25, did we ever get to 9,600 baud? I know there are a few um, radios that can do 9,600, but I don't believe it ever got into common use. Like, I know my um, Kenwood and D72 for, and D74 HTs, for example, um, have 9,600 capability, but I have just never, I've never actually seen it in, like, common use anywhere, anywhere I've lived. So um, I think we kind of um, just stopped really using Packet all that much after, um, after 1,200, as far as I can tell. What was the first rig that you got then after you got your license? And you got your license, what, in 2001? March 2000. Actually, I got a Kenwood um, D700, um, so basically a 50-watt mobile rig, and ended up getting one of those um, Magmount um, antennas. And I actually was using it indoors, like on like a baking tray. So that, like, um, I didn't, I never actually set up anything outside at my parents' house. Um, and the, it's kind of... Um, like interesting, like um, when I first got my license, like I got discouraged by the the packet radio um, not being as fast as I would like. So I figured I'd try to I would try to like use the rest of the tech privileges. So like I ended up um, there's this one there's this one um, repeater system, the Keller Peak repeater system that I would hear every night, and I figured I w I would try to um, check into that. But um, I had a very 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 serious case of um, mic fright back then. So like um, I never got the I ne at the time I never got the like courage to actually like transmit on voice, um, which I sounds pretty probably sounds pretty bad now. But um, back then um, back then that was like another thing that kind of like discouraged me. Like I never really um, while I was while I was a kid I never really got over that. So like um, I think that contributed a lot to me um, kind of just putting that. Like putting that stuff, like ham radio stuff aside for a while, especially since I was going to college and I had to focus on college and that sort of thing. I think about that, too, every once in a while. If I'm connecting on All Star to a large repeater network, when you key up the microphone, you're thinking either of all the kilowatts you're burning up with all those transmitters coming up at the same time, but also maybe the hundreds or even thousands of people that might be listening at the same time to what you have to say. I think I get that. The Keller Peak uh, repeater system is, what, in the San Bernardino forest there, right above Running Springs, right? So it covers quite a large area, probably most of the L.A. Basin. Yeah, it, it covers pretty much a lot of Southern California. I can actually even pick it up here in San Diego where I live. Okay, well, so did you ever get over the bike fright? Do you operate voice services at all? I feel like I've gotten over it um, since I started back up in the ham radio. I actually st so like after college, I ended up um, like um, I still didn't get back into it for a bit until I got my own place. When I got my own place, um, I figured I'd I actually was um, renewing my license and stuff, so I still had it active. So uh, I figured I'd get back into ham radio a little bit, see what what's new and that sort of thing. I don't remember at the time like who told me this at the time, but like um, I heard that like HF might have might be a better like a better fit for me. So um, I went ahead and upgraded to general my general license around um, 2011 and after I upgraded my general license ended up um, playing I got my um, I got um, an ICOM IC7200 I lived in a condo so um, HOA is obviously and um, I tried to set something up inside and surprisingly um, like the indoor antenna type stuff never really worked all that great for me because um, as you're probably aware a lot of the construction in Southern California uses stucco with the chicken wire between the studs and the stucco, right? Yeah, so turns out that actually blocks a lot of HF. And then in addition, since I was living in a condo, I had to deal with the noise from my own electronics that I had running at home, as well as the electronics of all my neighbors. So um, the I believe my noise floor was pretty high. And um, at the time, like I believe um, like the PSK-31 was actually pretty popular. So I was, I did have a tiny bit of luck with PSK-31, but like, um, I'd only really hear like one or two stations while operating, operating within indoor antenna. And, um, 
So I didn't really operate all that much at home. Um, I tended to go and um, operate portable. Like, um, like I for a bit, I tried to do um, like summits on the air, for example. Um, and that was that was fun, but um, like I exhausted all of the walk up summits that were around here. So, um, and I realized that I definitely wasn't fit enough to like try to do um, try to actually like hike peak like the full on peaks and stuff. So, I ended up putting that aside for a bit. Um, the but yeah, I ended up um, since I was um, compromised in my station setup, I basically was preferring um, digital modes for the most part. And now this message from ICOM America. Happy holidays from ICOM. Spice up your ham shack this season with one of ICOM's popular handhelds, mobiles, or base stations. These radios are perfect for working your favorite bands while staying inside or venturing out this winter. It's the most wonderful time of the year to give a gift of ICOM. The ICOM IC705 is the perfect sidekick and QRP companion with base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. It has become the go-to baseband rig for microwave operators. Its features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen display with a live band scope and waterfall, 5 watts with a BP272 battery pack, and 10 watts with a 13.8 DC power supply, single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions, a micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, a micro SD card slot, the HM243 microphone speaker is included, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the ICOM 705 is the optional LC192 backpack. The LC192 includes a special compartment for your IC705 and additional room for accessories. The ICOM ID52A is a VHF UHF dual band handheld portable transceiver with D star and FM dual mode functions and is the first handheld amateur radio with a full color 2.3 inch waterfall display. This portable supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex, repeater, regional, worldwide calls over the D-Star Internet Gateway. You can even send photos over D-Star using your connected Android device. Other ID52 features include a wideband receiver with guaranteed range of 144 to 148 MHz and 440 to 450 MHz. VV, UU, VU with dual DV mode. Integrated GPS GLONASS receiver including grid square location, micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer, programming, and charging, and of course, it is in an IPX7 waterproof case. The ID52A is the perfect companion to the IC705 as both use batteries, headsets, and the same Android app for D-Star operation. Create your own band opening with the ICOM IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world and is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy, including faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. More features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen color TFT LCD with real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. The ICOM IC7300 is a high-performance HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed everyone's expectations. This transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. The ICOM IC7300 features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. 
This radio by far is the best HF rig that I have ever owned. I love it for its features and value. Now I realize that this is a big list to give to Santa. You can easily argue that all of these fine ICOM rigs complement each other and that you can't just have one without the others. Maybe Santa can even spread out the delivery of these great ICOM rigs before the next holiday season. In any case, be sure to tell your ICOM dealer that you heard about these amazing ICOM radios on the QSO Today podcast. And now back to our guest. Did you belong to the amateur radio clubs down there? Have you joined an amateur radio club? And do you have a mentor? Right now I'm in the San Diego County areas. The I didn't really do much in the way of clubs other than areas around here. Um, I actually, at one point I looked into the various clubs and a lot of them were meeting at times that weren't really convenient. Like, um, like they would be, they'd meet at like weekday evenings, for example, but like, um, for instance, there, for instance, there's a club in, um, Northern San Diego County, the Palomar Amateur Radio Club. And, um, they meet during the week. Um, I believe like every first Wednesday of the month, but this was like before the pandemic, like, um, like I'd have to get off work and then drive and deal with a bunch of traffic. So a lot of the time, like I wouldn't really, um, you couldn't get there in time. Yeah, pretty much. And it was a similar sort of deal with the other, um, like radio clubs around here. So, um, the nice thing about Aries was that, um, they met on Saturday mornings at eight in the morning. And that was something I could do because like Saturday morning, that early in the morning, there's basically no traffic. And like, um, it, that, it worked with my schedule pretty much. So um, that's how I originally got into Aries. Do you think that the meeting times that amateur radio clubs have, you know, those weeknights, because I think almost all of them probably do weeknights, that that may be one of the reasons that they may not be getting younger visitors or younger members to the club, that in fact Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings might be more convenient? That might be part of it. Do you have any peers that you've ever discussed this with? Not the club thing specifically, but I have, like, had talks with people about um like what we could do with like um having younger people be more into the hobby because i know in my experience i actually did get a coworker um to get his license he found like a balfang radio like on sale for cheap and i was telling him that like yeah you need a license to use that so i actually convinced him to get his tech license but as far as i know he never did anything with it it seems like that's a pretty that's a pretty big problem there's a lot of people who um they get their license and then they um just don't do anything with it either because no one really shows them how like what the hobby can do or they kind of like use it and they get discouraged and just kind of give up on it pretty much. Do you have antennas outside now? Even though you live in an HOA, have you figured out how you might get on the air without the HOA either discovering it or without violating the HOA? For the longest time, I had always assumed that like the HO would never approve anything. And I was the kind of person that I still, I am the kind of person that I don't really want to, I don't like um, relying on asking for forgiveness rather than asking for permission. In Israel, that's the operational mode. We always seek forgiveness rather than ask permission because permission will always be no. Mm -hmm. But you're the other way. You'd like to have permission before, so you don't have to seek forgiveness. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. In my experience in life in general, people tend to be more understanding, like, if they know what's going on. If you try to do something and it causes problems, for example, then there will be a lot less understanding of that. And they'll easily tell you to, like, stop operating, especially since a lot of um, non-hams aren't necessarily familiar with um, amateur radio. They may be less um, accommodating towards it if, if, if it's causing a problem for whatever reason. So what I ended up doing was... Um, when the pandemic hit, um, we all had to be inside, obviously. And um, the so I couldn't operate portable during that time since, like, the parks were closed. And I was kind of like, what the heck? I'll um, I'll ask for permission. Like, I'll so I went and um, I filled out the architectural request from HOA. And I, I included all this documentation about how I was going to put up an MFJ magnetic loop on the roof of, our bu of the building. Like, how I'm going to get the wire of the coax into my unit without drilling any holes or like doing anything like that. I basically included all this other documentation. And then when I went on the zoom meeting for the HOA, the next zoom meeting, um, they asked me a few questions and, um, they ultimately decided they ultimately granted approval, which I was surprised about under the condition that I didn't inter interfere with anyone. So now I actually do have a magnetic loop antenna on the roof of the building. Um, 
And it's pretty nice because um, I also made it clear that it wasn't really going to be visible from anywhere um, based on the how the buildings were constructed. They, the buildings have like a slanted roof around the outside, but there is a flat roof that's um, down like a few feet, like in, in the middle. Because of how that roof is laid out, like um, you can walk around the complex. And I think there's only like one place in the entire complex where you could see the top of the, of the mag loop. And you'd have to actually be looking for it to see it. It wouldn't be obvious just driving, driving down the street that like there was an amateur radio antenna outside. Did you use like a tripod mount or something like that on the roof there? If it wasn't going to penetrate the roof, did you have cement blocks or how did you do that? So Amazon actually sells a flagpole mount that you that's designed that you to that you can drive over the mount with your car and your car's weight basically keeps it straight. What I did was I used that and put a bunch of um, of blocks from Home Depot um, to weigh it down. And um, I have like a three or four foot uh, metal pole, like in into it, that the mag loop antenna is mounted to. I also have I also tie down the antenna to a few other blocks for st- that are around the antenna for stability. And so far, we've had like thirty mile an hour winds, of, like at more than a few times since then, and it's actually held. I wouldn't do that sort of setup in the mountain where it gets a lot windier, but um, for the winds and we typically get here. Um, it's actually um, it's actually held up pretty well. Is your magnetic loop on a rotator? No, the loop is basically predominantly oriented, so it's east-west. And the reason why I did it that way is I figured that most of my contacts would be um, East Coast U.S. and potentially um, Hawaii or Japan, Japan or Australia, like in the other side of the Pacific. And in fact, I actually do see a lot of Japanese stations, um, depending on the time of day on FT8. Your favorite operating mode are the digital modes? Pretty much. And it works out pretty well because um, I am compromised um, in the antenna. And I actually do try to run 50 watts or less, typically. Um, so to eliminate the or to greatly reduce the possibility that I'm causing problems to my neighbors. Um, when I first got everything set up, I actually um, I tried to operate 100 watts for a bit. And I was rebooting my, um, my um, wireless access point since I run an ubiquity um, access point here, and I had it mounted to the ceiling, so it was actually getting into the Ethernet that it was plugged into, so it would tend to reboot every time I tried to transmit at 100 watts. So I had to do a lot of um, choking here at home, and since I was having problems at 100 watts, I, in my own unit, like I was kind of concerned that I was causing problems with um, other units, even if the other units weren't fully sure what was going on. So that's why I tried to just run 50 watts or less to like, avoid that possibility. Be a QRP operator. Yeah. I'm just curious, what have you discovered with that magnetic loop antenna? You can hear a whole lot better? I discovered that um, it does block out a fair bit of the noise. My noise floor is still about an S3 or S4 on 20 meters most of the time. But um, I imagine like if I had that still better than um, the noise floor that I was getting when I tried to do an attic dipole, where um, the attic dipole was basically S9 pegged all the time. From all the noise and from all the noise inside my unit and other people's units, so like I'm not 100 percent sure what like what part of that is a function of the antenna just being outside versus part of that like what part is just the magnetic loop blocking a lot of the noise by virtue of how it works. So you operate FT8 in terms of performance. What have you seen? Are you worldwide on FT8 depending upon the band and the time of day? I find that I don't I don't really get much in the way of DX. A lot of the vast majority of my contacts that tended to be um, North America. The most common countries that I do see um, DX wise are, um, like I said, Japan and um, Australia and New Zealand, just by virtue of like the propagation being better over water versus just over land. And I'm, and I'm okay with that. Like, um, I don't really find myself to be a, that big of a DXer. Like, I'm not trying to get all the countries in the world. Like, it, I do find it cool, like, if I end up getting a country that I haven't seen before, of course. But, like, um, like that's not, like, a thing that drives me in ham radio in general. Did you say that you're now operating, what, the IC7200 from your house? That's the radio that I started with. I got into SDR radios. Um, so I ultimately ended up with a radio called the Hermes Light. And that's a QRP radio, but um, it actually um, works pretty well. Um, the radio hardware itself is open source, and the... There's a lot of um, very nice software packages that you can use to operate that. And with um, 
it's easy to wire up the radio t- to a QRP amplifier. So right now I have it wired up to my Hard Rock 50. So I can do about 50 watts with the Hermes light. And you like the fact that you're probably operating your rig from a laptop or a pad or something like that, right? Yeah. No controls. Pretty much. Like, And it also opens up the ability for me to, to operate the radio remotely, even though I do have a magnetic loop. So that's something that I ended up, like, when I got my Hermes light, I decided that I wanted to try to remote the radio. And I figured, like, magnetic loops, traditionally, you've had to, like, physically be at the control box for it and push the buttons to, like, tune the loop. I figured, like, since I do have access to a waterfall by virtue of um, being having an SDR, that if I could figure out how to get the, the magnetic loop to tune um, remotely, that would be pretty nice. So um, I ended up finding out that um, I think someone else actually reverse engineered how that worked. Um, so it's basically um, plus or minus 12 volts with, a, um, with an H-bridge type circuit. That's effectively, what, that's effectively what it is. And the H-bridge is connected to an isolated power supply, which is why MFJ gives you a whole bunch of warnings on how you only should be using their power supply and not trying to plug it into your own like station power supply, for example. So I actually, um, even I actually decided that I would try to um, do like do a little bit of hardware design. So um, that's I ended up starting to get into hardware design a little bit, and I ended up rolling a um, or spinning a board that um, basically had headers for an ESP um, eighty two sixty six um, dev board, effectively with like the with like the necessary hardware, basically solid state relays and the isolated power supply um, needed to. Um, actually control the loop. And then I wrote like some software on the ESP that basically has a web interface that um, with like buttons where I can push and actually tune the loop. And it's pretty cool because when I do that, I can see the loop tuning in real time on the waterfall on the radio. So essentially as it gets on frequency, the waterfall comes up. It's like turning up the RF gain control when you get the loop tuned. That's very interesting. So the MFJ magnetic loop doesn't tune itself. It doesn't have an automatic tuner. You actually have to fiddle with it with your fingers. There is a semi, um, it's a semi-automatic setup on the box that came with the MFJ loop. So basically you would transmit like a carrier and um, push like the upper, the fast upper and down button, depending on, um, depending on where you currently are and where you're trying to go to. And the, the box automatically stops when like it's close, the SWR is close to one to one. And then there's fine tuning buttons that you push while you're watching the while you're watching the dials, the meters on the front of the radio, the MFJ loop controller, and um, until you get like the lowest SWR. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod VA3ON, Mike VA3MW, Mark N6MTS, and Vince VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Does operating the radio on FT8, does that satisfy your itch, your ham radio operating itch right now? And if it doesn't, what would you like to be doing? I find that um, FT8 is good, but um, I can't really do it for more than like an hour or two at a time because it is basically just um, you are basically just sending a signal report and like um, your call sign and just doing a QSO that only lasts like a minute or two. So I started gravitating more towards modes that are still digital, but um, like do have do allow you to have like actual like conversations for example a jsa call and like digital voice type stuff as well all of this on hf correct one of the reasons that we're talking is because you've been a frequent contributor to the qso today virtual ham expo which i appreciate very much and one of the presentations that you made was on the free dv project which i think is an hf digital voice project can you talk a little bit about what free dv is 
and how it might affect ham radio operations on HF. So FreeDV stands for Free Digital Voice, and it's basically a digital voice mode similar to um, DMR or DSTAR, for example, but it's optimized more for HF band conditions. So for instance, the voice codec that it uses um, is a lower bit rate, um, so that you can deal with the, they can deal with the lower available bandwidth on HF, and the modulation as well is um, geared more towards um, the various propagation conditions that you would commonly see on HF. For example, um, the selective fading. What kind of bandwidth are we talking about when we're talking about operating digital voice on HF? About the same as a digital mode like FT8. So the narrowest FreeDB mode that's available is um, about one kilohertz wide. So it's still about a third of the width of a typical sideband signal, for example. Um, definitely not as narrow as FT8 or another um, mode that's geared more towards just transmitting data. And how does it sound? What's the user experience if we're operating digital voice on HF? So once the FreeDB goes in the sync, um, you, the background hiss and fade that you would normally hear on um, HF basically goes away and the... It is armchair copy, but it does have the same sort of um, audio quality in terms of like how the how your voice sounds um, as other digital voice modes. So it does have the robotic type sound that um, some people may not be fans of, but that's um, similar to DMR or DSTAR in that respect. Is it more forgiving for signal fading? I would say so, yes. There are various 3dB submodes um, that are more optimized for um say, fast fading, for example, where you, that you would normally see on an NVIS type path. But I find that the signal, that FreeDV in general is fairly resilient. There is one FreeDV mode in particular, that one kilohertz mode that I mentioned, that can go down to an SNR of uh, minus two. So if you compare that to the six decibels or so that you would require for single sideband to basically be armchair copy, that's a significant improvement in my opinion. And can you operate as much bandwidth on free DV or HF digital voice as, say, an AM carrier, so that maybe you could compete with the AM guys on 80 meters? None of the free DV modes that are available can go up to 6 kilohertz. The I believe the widest one we currently have that's at, in testing right now can is about the same width as a normal sideband signal, so about 2.5 to 3 kilohertz wide. Um, but the voice quality is significantly improved. Of course, that's at, at the expense of... Um, reliability on HF when the band starts going. That seems to make sense. So obviously the narrower the bandwidth, the more reliable the signal could be in fading conditions. Right. Well, that's interesting. Where do people operate? If I am now a digital voice capable, and we can talk a little bit about how to be digital voice capable, but once I'm digital voice capable, where do I find other people who are operating digital voice? Well, most of the activity is on um, 20 meters, 14.236 megahertz. Um, it is usable. It is basically usable on um, any other band where you can do voice, except for um, 60 meters. Um, but this this depends on the co your country, of course. Um, in the U.S., um, 60 meters is actually regulated more strictly than the rest of the HF bands. So um, you can only use analog voice on 60 meters. So that's why 60 meters is a no go if you're American off of free DV. To answer your question about where you can find people. There's actually a few ways you can find people. Um, there's, a, there's a website called the FreeDB QSO Finder, qso.freedv.org. And it basically serves as sort of a chat room. But um, the difference is that every person in the chat room has a frequency that they're currently on attached to them. So you can see who's on the band at when a, whenever you log in and QSY to whatever frequency other people are on. And you can also coordinate with people in that chat room. So, like, for instance, if you if someone's not being received all that well, you can tell them in that chat room to um, QSY to this other frequency, for example. And another way you can find people to get to contact, which is more recent within the last few years, is um, FreeDB has an option to report to the PSK Reporter website. So you can actually see um, where your signal is getting out on a map. And I find that that's pretty cool because... Um, you can see how the propagation is going, even if um, someone maybe is not right at their computer to respond back to you. You can at least see where your signal's getting out. And is it smart enough that if you say your call sign, that the PSK Reporter website actually reports your call sign? 
How does that work? Or do you actually embed your information in the digital signal itself? The information is embedded in the digital signal itself. Um, there's a setting in the 3DV application that you go to where you put your call sign in grid square, and it will only do the PSK reporter reporting when you do that. And so basically, once you do that, whenever you transmit, there's a very low bit rate um, side channel inside the signal that's transmitted. And inside that side channel, we basically just transmit your call sign. And other people who are also enabled for PSK reporter um, basically pick that up and decode that call sign. And there's um, statistics inside the FreeDB application that indicate what your signal to noise ratio is. And that, along with um, your grid square and the call sign that was heard, get reported over to the PSK Reporter website. Now, do I need any external hardware to operate 3DV? Or if I can do FT8 or JSA call on my rig because it has maybe a direct USB connection to it, will that work? What do I need to operate FreeDV? If you're already set up for FT8, for example... You're likely already using some sort of radio interface, whether that's a signal link or, like what you said, a direct USB connection. So basically, the other sound card that you would need for the analog side of things would basically be the sound card that's built into your computer or potentially something like a Bluetooth headset, for example. Bluetooth directly to the radio or Bluetooth to your computer through the interface to the radio? So Bluetooth to your computer. The 3 the application would basically take the audio from that Bluetooth headset or from your internal sound card, for example, and modulate that into the digital 3 dB signal and send that out over the radio interface. For instance, like um, if you have a direct USB connection, it would typically show up as another sound card. So um, you are setting up two sound cards inside the 3 dB application, but in effect, like one of the sound cards is like the sound card you've been using for digital modes in the past. The other sound card is what you would normally use for recording like audio, like a podcast, or like if you're into like, like live streaming on Twitch, for example, like, like whatever you're using for that as just as an example. And the three DV software is available on windows, Apple and Linux. Correct. Regardless of the kind of computer that you have, you're covered if you want to operate three DV. That's correct. And what do you think the real advantage is? What do you think is going to win people over to operating free DV? I believe the basically just the smaller bandwidth and and like um, the the higher resilience in general. Like a lot of younger people, for example, have compromised station setups either because they live somewhere where they can't necessarily put up the best antenna in the world, for example, or like they mostly operate portable. And something that needs lower bandwidth um, is going to work better with that, those sorts of setups. And I think that's going to be a pretty big draw especially as there are more younger and younger people that get into the hobby. That's a cool idea. The impact of FreeDV is that if you already can run the digital modes, then you should be able to already run FreeDV. And it gives you an opportunity to brag chew, I'm assuming, that having a FreeDV conversation is the same as having an SSB conversation. Right. That's pretty amazing, actually. Do you have to have some frequency stability in order to make this work? Meaning that do you think you need to have some kind of GPS or oven crystal locked transmitter in order to make sure that you don't drift all over the place and you're out of sync? So it has a little bit of uh, ability to correct for frequency variation. But in my experience, um, a lot of the radios that were built in the last 10 or 20 years seem to be okay with, like stable enough for a free DV operation. Like I haven't really seen any any signals like on the air that have really, really drifted um, severely in quite a while. So a lot of the radios that are available today, I believe, can just are stable enough to do free DV out of the box. We will return to our guests in just a moment. Nuts and Volts Magazine is a new sponsor, and it's an amazing resource for new and old hams alike. Click on the banner to get your online or paper subscription of Nuts and Volts. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. What do you see is the next frontier on free DV? I mean, what needs to be done in order to either make it more popular or to make it more stable. I know that you're working with David Rowe, VK5DGR, on this, and he was a guest in episode 156 of the QSO Today podcast. So what are you guys working on? I believe the big thing is going to be um, 
getting it integrated into HF radios in general, while there is an application and that makes it accessible for the people out there, I believe that the less that people have to do to set up themselves for free DV, the better. So the ultimate holy grail in that is going to be like having it built into the various radios. A switch position, essentially. CW, SSB, free DV. Right. And there has been progress made in in that. Um, the MCHF radio, for example, does have um, free DV built in. And the Quiscom application for SDR radios, such as the Hermes Light, does have um, does have a free DV button in so you can just use Quisk instead of also having to run the free DB application. But we are definitely still working on getting more radios with it built in. And that's by approaching the manufacturers directly? Yeah. Like Yesu, Ken, would you contact them directly and see whether or not they're interested? And what kind of response do you get? We haven't done that much in the way of contacting the manufacturers yet. I have reached out to a few. The feedback does seem to be positive. Um, but, of course, they're... As FreeDB is an open source project, there are um, there are complications with that since um, the manufacturers, of course, want to make want to protect their own intellectual property. So they want to, if they are going to integrate FreeDB, they want to do it in a way that doesn't require them to open up the like, basically provide the source code to the radios um, to everyone, right? So um, that's something that we're still working through. Essentially, then it could be an outboard app on a radio rather than embedded in its operating system. That's possible. There was, like, we actually have done a few hardware devices. The most common one, I, one is now is called the SM1000. And what that effectively is, is it's a handheld microphone that can do free DV. So there is an RJ45 at the bottom, and you wire that up for your whatever radio you're running. And there's also a barrel jack for 12 volts. Um, and that does. Um, that does work pretty well. Um, the big issue with it is that it does. Well, the big issue with it is that it's the supply chain issues basically made it no longer available, and there's no ETA because um, there are some parts that have been discon- effectively um, end of life. Um, but it was also a fair bit at the time. It was also a fair bit of money. Um, like it was a two. Like it was about two hundred dollars at the time, and that is um, that's not completely out of the question for. Um, that's not completely unreasonable for um, ham radio because, as we as we know, ham radio can be a pretty expensive hobby. But two hundred dollars is still um, the kind of money where you'd have to stop and think before you actually spent that money. That could very well have turned be turning off have turned off people. I've actually been working on a um, effectively an iteration of it called um, EZ DV. It basically uses an ESP32 instead of the STM32 that the SM1000 was using, and the SP32, what's nice about it is it has Wi-Fi built in. It's also only about four to six dollars and for the actual module in small quantities. So it opens up opportunities to reduce the price significantly, potentially. Um, it also opens up the possibility of um, com- um, using more modern ways of interfacing with radios. For example, the ICOM IC705 um, has the ability to act as a Wi-Fi access point and connect to Wi-Fi networks generally. So EZDV actually has um, support for connecting to the IC705 over Wi-Fi and actually sending and receiving the digital uh, 3DV signal through that instead of having a cable plugged into it. It definitely improve. It actually it significantly simplifies the setup since um, you're only having to plug in your headset into EZDV rather than having to plug in your headset and power and um, your radio interface, whatever it is even though it does have the ability to um, have a wired interface to your radio as well. So are you optimistic about the use of free DV then on the air? Do you hope to see more and more? Are you seeing more and more people coming into this modulation scheme on HF? Yeah, I am actually pretty optimistic that um, free DV will get more and more use over time. Um, we've, been doing, we've been doing quarterly activity days, um, which are basically weekend events where people get on the air at over the weekend and actually do free DV. And we, we recently concluded our last one and there were about um, 300 or so unique contacts over the course of the weekend uh, across uh, about 50 um, unique operators. And from the reports that I was seeing, it was actually a lot of newer people getting on that haven't done free DV before. And we're also, um, because of the, 
the results we've gotten this last one, we actually are moving to doing these events monthly instead of quarterly. Um, so from now on, they're going to be the third weekend of every month. So the next um, FreeDB Activity Day is going to be um, December 18th through the 19th, um, 2022. So um, we hope to that because it's moving to monthly instead of quarterly, that they'll it will give more people an opportunity to get on the air and operate FreeDB. Well, that sounds pretty exciting. I also saw a paper that you presented about WinLink gateways on the cheap as a member of the WinLink development team that you are. Can you also now talk about WinLink? Because I think I have some idea that WinLink is a nautical, it's for hams at sea, equipment is expensive. Why would I want to operate WinLink from my base station? Those are a few questions, but let's talk a little bit about WinLink now. So WinLink is... Um, as some may be from aware, is an HF radio email system, or also VHF and UHF. So basically, radio um, radio email generally. You mentioned that it like the multiple hundred dollar um, device devices needed for WinLink. That's actually um, a lot of the a lot of the innovation in the hobby has actually been around software modems. As like that's why you see stuff like um, FT8 and um, all PSK. 31 and all the other various modulation schemes on HF. And the upside of that is that it's actually made it um, less likely to, that you need um, an extra device to use um, WinLink effectively. Um, in fact, WinLink actually does have, um, it has um, RDOP, which is a modem that it developed that's built into the WinLink Express email program. But there's also, um, it also supports um, other software modems. For example, UZ7HO's um, packet modem for um, for VHF and UHF packet, for example. And it also supports something called VARA, which is the, which is a, it, it comes out of, from a ham that's based in Spain. And it's, um, it actually has much faster speeds compared to like what packet we used to do. Um, and it's, and it actually on HF as well, like VARA can actually um, approach the same sorts of speeds that you're that you were able to do on, say, Pactor 3, for example. So it's a very inexpensive way for people to get into WinLink versus what you used to have to do, which is to spend $1,000 on a Pactor modem. This is where I was confused. So it's actually Pactor that I was thinking about, not WinLink, because Pactor was the original email HF program or system? Well, Pactor was uh, the original um, data mode that um, WinLink was using. It, like tradition in the past, you used to have to plug in a Pactor modem to your computer and operate WinLink through it. So the Pactor modem would be doing the modulation and demodulation. Now you're doing that in software in the computer itself, so you don't actually need that external hardware. Right. It's not pack like we're not a modulating or demodulating Pactor in software, of course. Like it's it's different modes that it's using, but it you are right. It is using software effectively instead of an extra hardware device. Now. Except for people at sea who are away from email, why would I want to operate WinLink? Is there some advantage, or do you see it more as a kind of a prepper mode that we should operate WinLink so that when the stuff hits the fan, we will know how to operate it? What's your thinking on this? So there is a lot of use of WinLink for, say, um, MCOM and Aries type stuff. But I actually do have a story um, about um, WinLink not in that context. One field day, I actually went and operated from a campsite that's up in the San Diego mountains. In my research at the time, like it sounded like there was going to be cell service. But when I got there, it turned out there was no cell service. But I did have my laptop and I did have WinLink installed. So like I was able to send an email to my loved ones, um, basically saying that I got to the campsite safely and I didn't have cell service. So that's why I wasn't able to call. I believe WinLink is useful for stuff like that as well. Obviously, in California, there must be hundreds of square miles where there may not be reliable cell phone service. So it might be cool to use that. Can you actually make a pretty small WinLink package? Can you operate a KX2 or something like that on WinLink? Yeah, you can. I've actually I've actually used a KX3 with um, just the audio cables going into one of those $3 um, USB sound cards. And I just used Fox on the KX3. And it actually worked... Um, that actually worked better than I thought it would. So acoustically coupled or with a cable? Not acoustically. Like it's still, I have one link set up to go through the USB sound card still, but the audio cables are plugged into the, KX, the KX3. 
So the KX3 would trigger um, transmit via the box K box function. Okay, so then the paper that I saw that you presented, and I'll put a link in the show notes page for this, is a WinLink gateway on the cheap. So the gateway is the connection, the base station connection to the internet. How does that work out? So when you send a WinLink email, it goes out over the air to one of these gateway stations. And typically, if there is internet access available, it will go out to the central WinLink system over the internet. But if the, if there's no internet availability, then there are there are several ways you can configure the gateway. Um, some gateways are configured so that it will forward via HF email over to another gateway that potentially does have internet access. And there are also ways to configure it so that it acts it just as a local mailbox so that it keeps the email locally until whenever the internet comes back or potentially just operates offline completely disconnected so that it you're just um, operating with as like a local mailbox sort of thing with whoever else connects to it. Now, are all of these WinLink gateways on the same frequency and you say which one you want on the software or are these WinLink gateways on different frequencies and so you actually have to find the one that you want to talk to and send the message? They're all on different frequencies, but there is a um, centralized um, directory of where these are located. So... Um, when you go into the WinLink application, you can actually select which gateway you want from that list. And there's also the ability to update that list over the air or update that list via the Internet, depending on what you have access to. Now, does WinLink have frequency allocations or are they just there? Where do we find WinLink gateways? Typically the same places where you would find um, data modes generally. On VHF and UHF, it would typically be the same frequencies where you could find packet. And on HF, there are, some of the bands do have dedicated, um, semi-dedicated blocks that are designed for automated gateways. I know 40 meters has about a five-ish kilohertz um, allocation that's designed for um, th those types of gateways. Because I know there are rules saying that if you go out, if you set up a gateway outside of those, you're limited to 500 kilohertz wide signals or something along those lines. So there are gateways that operate outside of those, like like um, automated station areas on HF, but they are they do operate slower because they are restricted in terms of, of um, bandwidth. Does WinLink scratch that itch that you originally had to run messaging and over ham radio frequencies? I believe so. It's still, of course, not as fast as, say, um, say just using a computer with Internet, but I'm, I mean, I believe it does, um, I believe it does scratch that itch pretty well. And there are, um, there are, people who are working on even faster um, methods of data communication. For example, um, the Arden project, which basically just uses um, Wi-Fi effectively, operating as a mesh-type network. But they have a lot of bandwidth up in the microwave frequency bands that we don't have in the HF bands. But do you see a synthesis of Arden and WinLink, for example? Is it possible to find WinLink gateways on Arden mesh networks? There actually are a few um, gateways that do operate on Arden. I don't have any stats or anything as to um, how common that is because um, Arden actually isn't that big in San Diego yet. There aren't that many. There aren't that many much in the way of just Arden mesh nodes in general around here. I know, like up in LA, for example, there are a lot more Arden users, so it's probably more likely you'd be able to find an Arden WinLink gateway, for example, up there. What do you think the greatest challenge is to amateur radio now, from your standpoint? I think it's just um, getting getting people um, to stick with it after um, getting after going through the effort and getting licensed. Um, and there's like a lot of factors that play into that. Like, um, for instance, um, clubs in general aren't as big as they used to be, so a lot of people get their information from, say, like Reddit or another online source. The Elmering may potentially not be as great as it would be if it was actually someone local in person. So a lot of people, as I was mentioning, would seem to just, um, they get their license and then they just don't know what to do with it. So they kind of just, um, they play around with it for a little bit and then just um, stop really using it. So I think the challenge would be to just get people to just stick with it because um, it's all well and good if the, like that we're not losing licenses at least. Like um, if you, but it, the bands do sound quieter than they used to, they used to. So um, it would be good to have, um, like, to be able to, to be able to get people to actually um, stick with it so that they would um, set so the band, so that, so that we do have, like, more long-term 
use of the radio effectively. I'm going to beg your forgiveness before I ask the question. I'm trying to understand, you know, what we're doing. Us grandfathers who've been in amateur radio for years and years, you know, why we're not attracting the younger people to the hobby. So the question is, do you think that people in your generation hesitate to reach out for help? If you don't belong to an amateur radio club, then you probably don't meet the people. But you said you belong to your ARES group that meets on Saturday morning. Do you reach out to those hams for help in terms of helping you with antennas or helping you with whatever in order to kind of move your ham radio ball forward? I'd say occasionally. I find that um, I do a lot more um, like Googling and that sort of thing personally. Um, as I was kind of mentioning in the in the FreeDB um, talk like discussion earlier, the the less um, friction there is, the more likely someone's going to use something. And if you just tell someone to go Google something, then some people might actually do that. But um, a lot of people that does turn people off. So um, when, especially if it's something that like maybe is relatively simple to to answer, especially if um, someone's new and they don't necessarily know where to look for this type that type of information. But is there a hesitation to ask for help? I mean, is your first preference to see if you can Google it rather than pick up the phone and call somebody that you know might know how to do what you want to do quickly? Yeah, I, I'd say that that's my first um, my first inkling is to like try to look it up myself first before asking for help. I always found the secret to good Googling is you know how to ask the question. Do you find that ham radio questions are, are more difficult, at least at the beginning, in terms of knowing what question to ask? Maybe not as much as it used to. Um, the there are a lot of um, very good um, ham radio resources out there now online. Like, um, for instance, there are various YouTube channels that have that basically just do ham radio, and they have a lot of um, really good content on that on those. So I think the basic general questions aren't as like um, as hard to ask as they as they used to be. As mysterious as they once were. Mm -hmm. What excites you the most? by what's happening in amateur radio now? Although it seems to me you're on the cutting edge, so I, it seems to me you could be excited by a lot of things. I think, like, the the innovation that's out there, especially, like, SDRs and, like, new modes in general, um, I think is the most exciting thing right now. In the past, for a very long time, we were kind of were just stuck with um, the traditional modes we've always known, like, um, like sideband AM, CW, for example. So the fact that we're able to synergize like computer technology to like basically come up with all these new modes that like do all these cool things, I th I think is pretty cool. And what advice would you give to newer returning hams? I would say that a lot of stuff has changed since you were last in the hobby. So um, definitely um, definitely like watch or listen to stuff like um, like this podcast and like take advantage of all the other resources that are available on YouTube and other places online and, um, and find all, and you'll probably find all these cool things you can try as well. Munir, it's such a pleasure. Again, I want to make sure that I recognize that you've been a great contributor to the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo in the past, and I hope that you continue to, and that I'm looking forward to now exploring WinLink, which I hadn't thought much about, but maybe I'll look at it again, and also uh, what you're doing on free DV. And I'll start using my radio and my 7300 and get some software and see if I can actually hear any free DV contacts and even make some. So with that, Mooner, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. Thank you for coming on the QSO Today podcast. Thank you. Thank you for letting me be here. I'm 73 as well. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Mooner. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in K6AQ in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates on the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo coming in March. I'm updating it as I have more information. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of this fine sponsor by clicking on their link in the show notes pages. 
You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, click on the Transcribe button at the top of the show notes page. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. By using the Amazon link on the home page before you shop at Amazon allows Amazon to send us a small commission on what you purchase that further keeps our QSO Today project going. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as we work towards episode 500. QSO Today is now available on a large number of podcast players and now a host of podcast services and applications. We are Podcast 2.0 compatible. I now use the Fountain Podcast Player to listen to all of my favorite podcasts. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today Podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.